We are um, recording now. Hello, everyone. Um, we haven't done one of these for a while, but um, I hope it's um, useful. Um, uh, this afternoon, Martin sent me um, a question about a sedge that he'd found today. And I think you've got a tentative um, ID um, on this one, uh, Martin. Uh, uh, Carex divulsa. Um, yep. Now I don't I don't know we haven't got any well we've got Graham uh, but we haven't got any of our other botanists with us this evening uh, I don't know how you are on sedges Mike um, but um, uh, we um, uh, there's a slightly closer photo and then an even closer one and then finally this one so. Um, does anyone feel confident enough about sedges to hazard a guess at this one? I must say sedges are quite a difficult group and we're we're probably not the best group of people to um, to do it. it. The habitat's quite important um, in working out what kind of group of sedges it is. You know, is it wet, is it dry, that kind of thing. Section Park Wood. In a wood. Yeah, section park wood. Was it, was it wet underfoot particularly, Mike? Was it in a ditch or anything? Yeah, or, um... and there's other sedges nearby. There's some pendulous sedge not far away. Um, okay. But it is on a, on a dry... Um, dry footpath, really. It's so, not... So... The, the, is, is this one possibly that um, we, we need to um, refer on to some of our botanists? It does say on your uh, on nature spot that the counter recorder will probably want to see it. Yeah. yeah. I'm struggling with it. I, I have recorded Carex divorza, but uh, I, I wouldn't be sure that that is Carex divorza. I think it's it's one for Jeffrey Martin. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's. Um, uh, we we recommend sending your your photos into um, Jeffrey. I'll so, send him some, I'll send him some of the real stuff. Yeah, yeah, but that would be good. Um, it it it's not it's not the easiest one. <laughs> <laughs> You've challenged us at the beginning. Yeah. It, it does it does Sedge look probably like it. Just looking in my sedge book, but you'd have to look at some of the details. I think to confirm it. Yeah, I think I think to confirm it, Jeffrey might want to see it anyway. So it's probably just as well to send it to Jeffrey. There are two subspecies of it. If you've got a if you've got a specimen, he might be able to do that. So, well, I'm sorry um, we couldn't come up with a uh, a straightforward answer with you uh, for that one. Um, if I just carry on then briefly. Um, I just got a few recent finds. Um, this one was from last uh, Friday. Um, took the vacuum sampler out um, last Friday and after really quite a, a difficult April, um, a April I basically gave up uh, recording uh, other, other than at the edges of lakes and streams and reed beds and, and where, where the ground was wet underfoot because everywhere else I was finding so little with the combination of frost and drought. Now, of course, the rain has brought things on, but um, a lot of insects are taking time to uh, respond. Um, so um, I found quite a lot of, of these um, and um, it's not really obvious from this photo, but when you see them alive, um, they, they've got the, the wings held in this sort of tent-like position. And um, uh, the squares on this are uh, one millimeter squares. So although it looks a bit giant on screen, it's only four millimeters long, in fact. And um, when I uh, first had a go, had a, had a look at these, um, I, I must admit, I scratched my head and thought, well, I don't really know what this is. Um, and I asked Graham, and Graham wasn't sure either. Um, so um, uh, someone said to me, oh, it's a cicada. Well, <clears throat> there are cicadas uh, in, in Britain, or at least there used to be cicadas in the New Forest. Um, although I don't think it's quite clear whether they're still there or not. 
Um, however, they're a lot bigger than four millimeters. Um, but uh, that was that was the clue. It's it's not actually a cicada, but it is one of the plant hoppers. The the leg um, is a bit of a giveaway. Um, and actually, it turns out to be uh, this rather difficult to pronounce species, Tachysixus pilosus. And um, not, not a great photograph, but in fact, in, on the specimen, you can see there are three stripes on the forewing. You can only sort of see the end of the stripe uh, in, in the photograph. Um, so um, uh, I, I was reasonably confident, but fortunately, Joe Botting was able to confirm that for me. So we have a few records of this, um, but um, not that many. Um, it's one of those uh, things which gets overlooked, I think. But um, there were quite a few uh, down at Foss Meadows last Friday anyway. So that's, a, that's another one to uh, add to the list. What were you taking them on, Alan? What have you um, it, it, was, it, it was a mixture of... Um, uh, nettles and moss and various other things, um, but the, the the larvae feed on grasses, so I think they're quite uh, they they can be quite numerous. Um, I'm not sure about the adults, but the larvae feed on grasses. I don't think uh, I, I think they're quite they will feed on various grasses, so they they could turn up anywhere. I suspect this is one of these things which is actually relatively common. Uh, and, and just under recorded. Um, but there, there were, when I was tipping out the vacuum into a white pelt, um, there, there were quite a lot of them around. And um, normally I don't bother with things with wings, um, but I, th I thought, well, there's quite a few of these, I should have a look at them. Um, uh, whether it was because they were cold, they didn't fly, they didn't jump, they didn't do all the normal things that, that leaf hoppers do. And so far this year, I've not been able to find any adult leaf hoppers. They've all been nymphs, and mostly leaf hopper nymphs are a non-starter, uh, virtually impossible to identify in many cases. So um, uh, I, I kind of I haven't got my my leaf hopper brain on yet, but hopefully this is a sign of uh, better things to come as as the weather warms up. So that's the first one. Um, the other one. Uh, um, that I would mention, this, this isn't from um, uh, uh, Foss Meadows, this was a slightly early one, um, was, was, was this spider, um, Wolkenaria uh, antica. Um, actually, there are two really closely related species um, uh, that are quite difficult to tell apart, uh, but antica is the commoner one that comes up. So um, you can't see very much from this angle. You can see something slightly odd going on here on this. So this is a male specimen you can see from the uh, pulps. But if you look at it from the side, it has this quite remarkable uh, cephalic modification. So a lot of uh, the um, uh, money spiders, the linifeids, have these, the males, the females don't tend to have it, it's the males that have these cephalic modifications. And if you look more closely at it, you can see that it's got this really weird TV aerial um, on the front, and then the, uh, the big lump and the groove, the, 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 called the sulcus, around and it's got eyes up here and eyes there are other vulcan area uh, there are some quite extreme uh vulcan area and there's there's one species that literally has eyes on stalks there's one that has a stalked extension the length of the uh, of, of the prosoma of, of the cephalothorax and and it's got one pair of eyes right on the top of the that and then the other eyes down here so this is a genus that's gone in for some really weird uh, uh, um, uh, variations. Um, they're all to do with, with mating. Uh, generally speaking, we, we don't really understand um, a lot of this, but I think this is undoubtedly, this is scent related. This has got something to do with pheromones and scent and, and something like that. Um, but um, there's so much that we don't know about this group of spiders, but I thought I would show that one because uh, I thought it was quite interesting. And uh, another one uh, from uh, a week or so ago, this spider, um, Edithorax gibbosus. And again, you look at it from the top and it doesn't look very interesting, 
but when you look at it from the side, it has this remarkable groove uh, that is stuffed full of these uh, silky uh, sort of fibers, hairs. Uh, again, this is a male modification. And the interesting thing about this species is that there are two forms. There's a form called uh, uh, form tuberculata, which just has a kind of a slight hump. And there's this form called form gibosus, which has this really big hump with this big groove in. And again, um, we don't really know what this is all about, um, but the feeling is it's something to do with scent. There's probably some sort of pheromone or some sort of glandular tissue in this groove releasing scent and the hairs have probably got something to do with that. But re really speaking, we don't know. Um, the interesting thing is you do find both forms together. You find the tuberculata form and the gibosus form at the same site and they overlap. So it's not like, it's not a geographical variation. Um, it's clearly a genetic polymorphism and they're in balance with one another. So there's all sorts of interesting genetics going on uh, with that. But uh, that's about the extent of our knowledge because that's how little we know about money spiders really. So um, all of these things are out there. They're, 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 not, they're not rare species, any of these. They're, they're really quite uh, common species. Um, so um, uh, you can find them uh, out and about. So um, keep your eyes open. You never know what you'll see. Okay, that's me done. Um, Dave, I think you've got some things to show. I have. Um, Want to share your see. slides? Share my screen. Uh, I That's thought, I, uh, yeah, you can see it. Uh, yeah. I thought I'd just talk a little bit about pond skaters um, because um, I found in the past that, um, well, I, I, I found this pond skater which seemed larger than the kind of common pond skater. This was a couple of years ago. And um, I managed to catch it, took it home and under the microscope, it looked quite different. And indeed it, it was, it was um, a completely different species to the common pond skater. And I'll come to that one in a minute. Um, but I, I just thought it was interesting just to reflect on uh, pond skater records in the county. Uh, obviously it's a really common insect. I'm sure we've all seen them um, that, that, that they're out and about at the moment. And most of them get assumed to be this one, the common pond skater, Jerry's lacustris. But um, we've actually changed our rating on Nature Spot to red because uh, you cannot tell just from a picture like this as to which species it is. Um, I looked on, on Orca, which is the uh, Leicestershire Rutland Environmental Record Centre database, just to see what has been recorded. And you can see here there's four species being recorded. Um, far and away, Lacustris is the commonest but I'm not convinced that they're all accurate. Um, I suspect there's been a few assumptions with, with many of those records. But there's three other records here. And um, the one at the bottom, Thoracicus, was the one I mentioned I found a couple of years ago. But uh, I, I grabbed um, a pond skater I just came across uh, a week or so ago, um, assuming it would be Lacustris. But when I looked more closely, it looked different and it turned out to be uh, a Dontogaster. So it kind of begs the question about what is the difference with all of these? Um, so starting with a kind of common one, you know, how on earth do you tell which species it is? There are eight species of Jerry's all together. We've only got four uh, records or records of four of these in Massachusetts and Rutland. But that's not to say the others aren't around. As you've seen, there's very few records for the species other than uh, the common one. And the key seems to be um, the, the pattern on the front femur. They have the, uh, the kind of background yellow color with these kind of black uh, stripes on. And the extent of the black is quite diagnostic. Also, the female is pale, is a pale brown underneath, whereas the other species are, are quite black. Um, 
you can split the eight species up into two groups fairly quickly. Um, the, there's three of them that have um, like an orange patch on the back of the pronotum. And that's pretty obvious once you've kind of caught one and had a close look at, at it. But the others are the typical very dark colored ones. Um, so it, it appears that you really have to look at, at some of the detail to, to be able to tell what species it is. Size is also quite useful. Uh, so the common one, Gerus lacustris, is kind of a medium size. I mean, it looks quite small when you compare it or when you see some of the other species. Uh, but there is one that's even smaller. Um, but this is the one I found last week. Um, it was, uh, I, I went to a little nature reserve in Colville called Nature Alive. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's an interesting kind of post-industrial site tucked away behind McDonald's and Aldi. It's a uh, mining subsidence caused uh, these lakes uh, and it's been developed as a nature reserve. So it's got some artificial ponds and things around, which is where I found this one. And first of all, I know you can see straight away on the front femur here, it, uh, it doesn't have uh, a basically yellow background with a, a smallish black patch on it. The black extend right up to the top of the femur. And the other thing which you can just about see on this one is down uh, on underneath the abdomen near the, 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 the tail end, these little projections. And if you look at those more closely, um, they're, they're, pretty, they're very obvious under the microscope. Uh, I don't know what they are. Um, they were only found in the male, so I imagine there's some kind of um, mating uh, adornment, but um, it's only this species which has them. So if you have a male, it's actually quite easy to identify from, from those teeth. It's a similar size to Lacustris. Um, it's not easy to tell a male from a female. If you can tell from the, uh, the shape of the sclerites uh, at, at, the, at the tail end. Um, but other than that, they are superficially similar. But as I say, if you find these teeth, then, then that's a, an, an obvious ID feature. You know what it is. And this one, um, which I've not seen, but is the other species that has been found in Leicestershire, is also easy to find if you've got a specimen in your hand, because both the males and the females have this yellow tubercle underneath uh, the, the metathorax between the legs. You'll see straight away how dark it is as well under the thorax compared to that picture I showed early, earlier of Lacustris. And also it's bigger. Um, it's the, whereas the customer is eight to 10 mil, this is 10 to 13 mil. So if you saw it live, it would be noticeably bigger. Now this species hasn't been recorded in Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, but if you look at the distribution map of records, it's found all around us. So I'm pretty sure it must be here somewhere. And again, if you've got the specimen in hand, it's, it's not difficult to identify, first of all, it's very small. It's uh, a lot smaller or significantly smaller than Lacustris, six and a half to eight millimeters. But um, both males and females have these uh, silver hairs forming a band on the edge of the pronotum. So if we could get, uh, you know, to ca people to catch uh, these and have a closer look at them, I suspect we will, we will get a very different picture to the numbers that were shown are shown on the orchid database. I suspect some of these other species would be much more common than that suggests. The other um, three species um, are the ones that I mentioned with the orange patch on the on the pronotum. Um, this is the one that, that I found a couple of years ago. And it's the only one of these orange dotted species that we've so far recorded in Leicestershire thoracic thoracicus. Again, it's bigger than the common one. Uh, I had a quick look at the other two that are not recorded just to see uh, whether they're just found on the coast or wherever. And certainly this one is, you can see uh, Coste is, is a mainly northern species. But the, the other one, uh, Lateralis, I, I, again, I suspect it must be in, in Leicestershire. There seems to be no reason why we haven't recorded it other than nobody's found it or managed to identify it. The other species that isn't uh, at all uncommon and often people superficially think is a pond skater 
is this one, the water cricket. It's actually smaller, more squat. And um, if you get a good look at it, it has, uh, it's quite colorful with these, particularly the, the white dots um, along the abdomens show up. There are actually two species in the UK, but the only one that's been recorded in Leicestershire is this one. The other one's quite rare. It's not to say it's not here. So I guess it would be a mistake to assume uh, if you found a water cricket, it is this one but the chances are it is. I found that they, they like uh, to live on streams in moving water rather than ponds, um, but they, 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 they hide away on, on, the, on the quiet back water you know, above, you know, where there's a branch, for example, that's fallen into the water, they will get behind it. And then they'll, they'll, they, they behave very similar to the pond skaters. They, they feed in the same way, they, they skirt around on the water tension, looking for uh, small insects that have fallen in to, to eat. Um, if, if you're into or can decide to go take your net out and go fishing in ponds, uh, you'll almost certainly come across uh, the, the back swimmers, Nota nectar. And there are four species in the UK and all four are found in Leicestershire and Rutland. Uh, in fact, I found before all four in the same pond. And they're quite distinctively different. And uh, so they're not at all difficult to identify if you can get, you know, any decent picture of the back of them, um, then you'd be able to just to work out which one it is. This particular picture um, is on the species pages under the identification aids. So again, if you've got a picture, you can always go and, and, and have a look at this for, for comparison. In terms of uh, identification, um, if, if you're kind of fairly new to pond life, particularly, you know, there's a whole range of bugs, there's um, many that I have not, not mentioned, then this, uh, the Collins guide, uh, field guide to freshwater life, uh, I'd recommend, it's very good. I wouldn't particularly advise using it to identify everything to species, but to give you a good idea of what type of creature it is you're looking at and maybe to get an idea, even possibly of genus, and then you can look at something more specialist um, to, to, to try and hone in on the detail. This book uh, here is, uh, is, is quite a specialist book. It's not expensive, I've, I've got this and I, I've tried using it. Um, it uses Gendet quite a lot for some of the bugs. Um, and it, it doesn't perhaps use as much as it could the um, some of the features that, for example, I've just mentioned with the, with the Jerry's. But this website I've mentioned at the top uh, is worth looking at, aquaticbugs.com. It, uh, it covers most of the, um, the, the, the aquatic bugs that we get. In, it's a, it's a, despite the website, it is a British site. Um, it covers most of the Jerry species, and uh, I, I found it really useful. It gives you the distribution maps as well as some ID features. So I'm just moving quickly away from from bugs. This was a. Can I can I just interject there briefly, sure. Dave? Um, if if you don't have a pond net, um, the other uh, place um, a lot of these bugs turn up, particularly the back swimmers, is in moth traps. Mm. Um, so please don't ignore the bycatch from your from your moth trap as well, because. Um, the identification resources are on the site. You, you can identify the other things that get in your moth trap as well. They, they fly around at night looking for ponds. Yeah, I find taking my uh, big pond net out a, a bit of a pain. I tend to only take it when I'm specifically going to search in a pond, but I don't really can see this on the, um, on, on the screen of me. I found this in B&Q for two pounds with a telescopic handle. That's really uh, good. So I just throw it in my bag now when, uh, whenever I go out. And actually, I found it really useful. You just come across a bit of water and, hey, presto, you can have a quick dip in it. Um, so no excuse from now on. So uh, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to mention this, uh, th this fly, uh, which, which I found out on a walk in, in the south of the county. Um, I, I kid it out as Ranfamaya. Uh, it's part of the Empidae family. You're probably familiar with kind of Empis, Empis tessellatus, the common one that you see later in the year on hogweed. Um, it's very closely related. Um, 
but I, I was struggling to to be sure of, of what species it, it was. So I, I sent it to uh, to Ray Morris, who's a county recorder for for flies, for his view, and uh, he he helped to confirm it, uh, this species of Subsinorassens. And it's only the third species for the county, he told me. Uh, so that was quite a nice find. Uh, again, I suspect it's not uncommon. It's just another one of those that nobody really records. And uh, as I say, the identification was quite hard work. So uh, it's not something you can you know, quickly identify on, on the run. While I was at that little nature reserve that I mentioned in Colville Nature Reserve, uh, the, the Nature Life, sorry, um, while I was fishing around in the net, I pulled out this uh, little bit of weed and um, it turns out it's, uh, it's bladderwort, which when I came back and I looked on, on the map and there was uh, hardly any records of bladderwort. And I remember a few years ago, somebody found it and flagged it up and Geoffrey Hall went running out to uh, whatever location it was to check it out. So I sent it to Jeffrey and said, oh, look, look what I found. And uh, thinking he'd be quite excited, he said, oh, yes, I, I know about that pond. It's in there. Um, and it must have been introduced at some point because it's an artificial pond with a pond liner uh, within the reserve. But uh, it's not a plant I personally have come across before. And it's a fascinating plant because it's, uh, it's carnivorous. And each of these uh, little bladders is actually an insect trap. And so if you look at more closely, they, 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 they're very cleverly designed. Um, they have a trap door on them with these hairs. You can just see the hairs coming out here. And these are trigger hairs. And uh, the, um, the, the bladders are filled with air, not with water. And when anything touches one of the hairs, like a little bath mirror or something, uh, the trap door uh, springs open. I think it actually drops in. And the water rushes in. And, and, and carries in the, the little creature and then the door shuts and then it, the, the plant uh, produces enzymes to break it down. Um, but it, I, because I've never really thought about it before, but having found a plant, I was looking at it and uh, there's been quite a lot of research done to look at the technology of these bladders because they haven't previously been able to work out how they work because they, it all happens so quickly and they, they reckon that it's, it's the, the water rushes in, uh, as it says, 600 uh, times the force of gravity uh, to carry in the, the, the animal. And uh, so uh, it's, it's quite a, a nice little find. Also at the site, I just thought I'd throw this up. I don't know what this is. I haven't been able to identify it. It's a tiny little caterpillar, and it was actually on, on lichen, on uh, uh, what, which uh, Parmelis sulcata. Um, so if anybody wants to help me out with <laughs> trying to work that one out, uh, I've been through the, uh, the, the caterpillar book um, and looked at all, looked up all the caterpillars that feed on lichen and I couldn't find it. It was very tiny. So, I mean, a lot of caterpillars, they change color, don't they, as they go through the different in stars. So uh, it, it might look quite different when it's, when it's a bit bigger, but um, it'd be nice to know what it was. And just follow Mark, uh, Mark Skellington's probably your best bet for that. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe try him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just thought I'd finish off by sharing this. I just uh, found this in the garden this afternoon. Uh, it's a, a very young nymph of the speckled bush cricket, which breed quite readily in my garden. And the young nymphs come out and sun themselves on, on the plant. So it was, I guess, sticking in and out between the showers. But really cute little thing, aren't they, when they're this size? It's only about three millimeters long. It'd be brilliant if it kind of grew to this size, wouldn't it? You know, imagine that crawling around your garden. Give hedgehogs a run for their money. <laughs> okay, that's me done. Thanks, Dave. Um, then if anyone's got any comments, um, I, 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 I would uh, add to what when you were talking about bugs, um, there's quite a lot of species of bugs um, where a definitive identification relies on having males, um, and um, uh, there's there's one in particular that's been bothering me for uh, some time now, 
uh, and that is uh, this one, um, uh, Aureus, Vicinius, uh, Vicinus. Um, th this is um, th there's 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 several species of these. Um, they are they are really very small. They're only a couple of millimeters long. Um, and I first caught one of these uh, last year, and um, uh, since then, um, I, I find them pretty much everywhere. Well, not not quite everywhere I go, but they're they're really very very common, and they're just overlooked because of their small size. Um, and I'm I'm ninety percent confident it is it is this species Vicinius. Um, but um, when when you get the the with identifying bugs, um, one thing you get used to quite quickly is, is flipping them over and, and looking at the external genitals. And this is a this is a female. This is like the ovipositor here. The males have a have a different have a sort of capsule at the end. And um, I've, I've found a lot of these um, uh, around the county in the last year. Um, and every single one I have found is female. Uh, and it's got to the point where it's starting to drive me to distraction slightly. Um, and I've, I've talked to the females just can't be identified. Um, I've, I've talked to uh, Tristan Bantock um, uh, and um, he, his, his reaction is like, oh yeah, <laughs> they're all female. <laughs> Male, males do exist. And I'm told there's a very short window um, sort of in the summer when you can find males, but even in that very short window, the females uh, outnumber the males by 20 to one. So you have to have a hell of a lot of these two millimeter bugs under the microscope to desperately try and find a male. And then you've got to dissect it without making a total hash of it on a two millimeter long bug without mashing everything up. So. One day I'm going to definitively identify one of these bugs, but uh, so they can be they can be quite frustrating bugs because uh, a lot of them uh, do unfortunately uh, need that they, they can't be done on external characters. I'm afraid so. That, that that's why I think a lot of things are under recorded because they're not easy to identify. Mm. That's true with a lot of flies as well. Yeah, um, like the sarcophagidae, you know, the flesh flies. Uh, and the and the really common small ones that you you, you find yeah. absolutely everywhere the anthomyids, yeah. um, the keys, basically only concentrate on males. The, the, there's a few females you can do, but the majority they ignore. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a lot we don't know, but I mean there isn't there is an answer as I keep telling people. Of course there is an answer coming over the horizon. Uh, that's DNA barcoding. Um, DNA barcoding will, will be here within 10 years. There are already some recording schemes that are investing in DNA barcoding. The Harvestman recording scheme uh, is, is, is working towards it. Um, and it's going to, um, well, quite, quite what changes DNA is going to make in terms of identification, I don't know. But a lot of the groups that are essentially impossible now uh, will, will, be, will be done. Um, and, and it'll just be a question of taking an environmental DNA sample, extracting the DNA, and then um, uh, uh, identifying thousands of species from that one sample. Uh, and that is, I mean, it's been done on, a, a, you know, on an experimental basis, but it, it will come uh, in, in the foreseeable future. But unfortunately, the cost of that is likely to be beyond the, the reach of the average amateur, unfortunately. And if you enjoy looking at uh, bugs, looking down the microscope, it's not like that. It's all about test tubes and mashing things up and extracting the DNA and then sending it off to some factory somewhere to be sequenced. So uh, things will change, but anyway, here we go. So I don't, I don't know if anyone else has got anything recently or I've got something I can quickly share, which I'm sure okay, you will probably know straight away, Alan, because it's spring tails. Um, it's been a difficult season for spring tails because of the drought. I've got a plant pot in my garden, which I've got loads of these underneath it. So I just found the other day. Um, yeah, so the, these, these little isotomids, so there's, there's three 
main groups of of of, of springtails. There are the globular springtails. Um, there there are the um, entomobryids, and the entomobryids have um, sort of a, 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 a uneven body symmetry, as it were. And and then isotomids, where basically each body segment is is more or less the same length. Um, and uh, these these tiny little white isotomids um, are really difficult to identify. They are all microscope jobs, really. I've got to admit that as county recorder, this is one of the groups I am very guilty of neglecting. Um, there's an awful lot of these things get recorded as Folsomia candida. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a springtail that's been used in laboratory experiments a lot. And it, it does turn up, it turns up in bags of compost and things like this. But this doesn't look like Folsomia to me. Um, so at that point, I think my knowledge has kind of run out and this, this would just have to be a microscope job and try and run it through um, this, the, the springtail key. Um, and even then they're phenomenally difficult. A lot of the, um, uh, one of the key features in these species is, is right at the end um, of the uh, the ventral surface of the sixth abdominal segment. Um, they, I, I don't know if you could see my mouse pointer. I'm pointing at things on the screen. I don't know whether that's visible to anybody else or not. Uh, but um, they have these, these micro spines um, underneath and the anatomy, yeah, that's right, just there. And the anatomy and number and arrangement of those micro spines um, is, uh, is, is quite crucial for a lot of these things. Um, but they are all microscope jobs, unfortunately. Um, this is one of the things where if you if you take a handful of soil um, and you um, and you and you put it in water and give it a stir and then let it sit, um, you you will find loads and loads and loads of these on the surface of the water because um, they've got a sort of a waxy cuticle and they float and they will they will pop to the surface. Um, but they are so tiny, they're less than a millimeter long, and you really need good light and quite possibly a lens as well to be able to even realize that they're there. And then when you get your eye in, you realize how many of these things there are in each handful of soil. And um, it, it, it's, it's not a group I've, um, I, I, I've, I've done a deep dive into really. Um, they do like it wet. They won't survive in dry environments. They will um, uh, they, they will desiccate very quickly. Um, but beyond that, I could not go. I'm afraid. So <laughs> so there, there 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 are very few globular springtails around in particular because they all got absolutely clobbered by the drought last month. Uh, in in midsummer, there's normally um, a dip in springtail species and the globular ones um, always disappear in the summer. Um, but at this time of year, we should have um, reasonable numbers around, particularly with the rain that we've had and the temperatures but they have not recovered from the drought. I have seen the last week or so, I am starting to record juveniles. Um, so they will be coming back. Uh, so in a few weeks time, they might be back again, uh, but it's the exceptional weather conditions that we've had over the, over the last year that has, that has made the, the difference. Um, there, there are a few species um, which have turned out to be uh, quite um, uh, common. Uh, I'll see if I can get some up on screen. Um, so um, uh, this, this one, um, let me just, um, uh, share this. I think you've recorded these a few times um, recently, Mike. Um, this is um, Orcasella velosa. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite a big springtail. Um, you, you probably, this, this can be um, about five or six millimeters long. 
Um, you, you probably don't even need a hand lens for this one. Uh, they are amongst the springiest springtails. Um, they can they can jump out of a margarine container. They will just spring out of there. Um, and they've got quite this quite characteristic pattern, this sort of crown shape on uh, on on the the second thoracic segment. You can't actually see the first thoracic segment, um, but um, uh, these are very drought resistant. So these have prospered over the last month, and I've found these everywhere I've been. But the 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 the, the globular ones. Uh, are are nowhere uh, to be uh, to be found. So um, uh, here is. Um, can you see this one? Yep. This is um, uh, a Dicetomina ornata, um, a slightly out of focus one. Um, uh, but um, the, I literally, when I was out last week, I literally found one of these. And you know that that's just weird. There should be there should be hundreds of them. So it's um, it's all down to the weather, folks. I'm afraid. So I think with that, um, I'll say uh, thank you uh, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us this evening.